Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the National Opera Center. My name is Mark Skorka. I am president of Opera America, and I want to greet this wonderful full house here in our audition recital hall at the National Opera Center, as well as our audience watching the program on our live stream. So we have a, a local audience and a global audience, and all are welcome in this wonderful event. For those of you who are visiting the Opera Center for the first time, we opened this facility in September of 2012. And at this point, we are welcoming about 5,000 people a month to the Opera Center who come here for programs like this, for rehearsals, recitals, readings of new works, sessions with uh, their coaches and voice teachers. It's a, a very, very busy facility built uh, and filled with opera singers and opera professionals. So welcome to the family if this is your first time. And during the reception afterward, I invite you to walk around and see more of the space. This evening, we have one of our program's creators in concert. Uh, many of you are aware that over the last 25 years, Opera America has granted over $12 million to opera companies in support of the creation and production of new opera. One of the things that we do to promote new opera is to welcome leading composers and librettists here to the Opera Center to offer evenings of conversation and music so we learn more about them and hear of uh, some excerpts of their recent works and even some upcoming works that have been premiered, as is the case this evening. So uh, this is an unusual program in that we're working with one of our member companies, the Cincinnati Opera. And some of you may know that the Cincinnati Opera is the oldest opera company of the 20th century in the United States. The Metropolitan Opera was started in uh, 1883, and in 1920, the second opera company in the United States that still is functioning today is Cincinnati Opera. They're approaching their 100th anniversary in just a few years. It is a company with a storied history of performances at the zoo, and you can hear more about uh, all of those wonderful stories of animals accompanying singers in concert, uh, and it's true uh, from some of our guests during the reception. But this evening, uh, Cincinnati Opera is here as part of a week of Cincinnati in New York. The May Festival is performing in Spring for Music at Carnegie Hall, and just down the street at the Joyce, the Cincinnati Ballet is performing. Uh, it seems fitting, then, that the Cincinnati Opera should be here at the National Opera Center. This evening, the works we'll be hearing are by the wonderful composer Ricky Ian Gordon. Uh, the nice part of this evening is that I don't have to moderate or interview anyone. I get to sit in the audience and watch the masters. Uh, the artistic director of Cincinnati Opera is one of the most distinguished opera uh, directors in the country, Evans Mirages, and of course, Ricky Ian Gordon, one of the most articulate and enthusiastic composers working in the field today. So without further ado, I again say welcome to the Opera Center. Please join me in greeting Evans Mirages and Ricky Ian Gordon. <laughs> have, a, have a good show. Thank you, friends, and welcome. Uh, I'm going to call this a conversation in uh, five parts and six pieces of music. And uh, because uh, we have music both past, present, and future from the rich catalog of Ricky Ian Gordon. And we are blessed today, as you see in your program notes, to have a real stellar collection of singers, all of whom have been associated with Ricky and uh, will go on to be associated with Ricky. I'd also like to call attention to the fact that in our audience tonight, in addition to many of our friends, are two, at least two, of Ricky's current collaborators, his librettist for the opera we will present at Cincinnati Opera next summer, Morning Star, Bill Hoffman is here. Hi. And Hi. hello, Bill. <laughs> And our dramaturg and director, Ron Daniels, is here as well. Thank you very much for joining us. All the librettists are here. Exactly. And if there's anybody else who's worked with Ricky, stand up. <laughs> I call it a conversation in five parts and six arias, because I have chosen five questions. Since I'm the moderator, I get to choose the questions. Um, and I'd like to begin, Ricky, with what a, a question that is normally considered something of a cliche, but I think it's I still think it's appropriate to ask. Because in your home, you have a piano in your living room, and you have an elaborate computer setup in your other sitting room. 
And I heard you today talk to an interviewer about your process, about it starts at the keyboard and then it moves to the computer. So does a melody begin as a noodle and then become something more elaborate? Or does it come full blown out of your head? How, where does it start? It, the, the process has changed somewhat. Um, but by the way, the piano in my living room is a little knobby upright that my mother charged at Macy's. <laughs> so I, I have to keep it. Installment um, plan? Yes. <laughs> she paid it off like 80 years. But um, it, um, I sketch things out at the piano, but it used to be that I wrote everything just, you know, pencil and paper at the piano, and I could like sing through my whole scores. But when I started writing The Grapes of Wrath, it was when I needed to work bigger. And then I taught myself all that um, finale stuff, because now I sketch things out with ideas, pencil and paper at the, uh, at the piano, and then I bring them into the computer, and I, once I enter them, a whole other process of composition starts, you know, especially because hearing has become a part of it. Like, I like to hear if I'm working in big textures, and a lot of Grapes of Wrath had thousands of choral interjections, and it was, so I felt a lot of times like um, I needed to hear what I was doing. I, I would like to say that I'm one of those composers who hears everything in his head, but I'm totally not. <laughs> so why lie? <laughs> so is it, um, Prima la musica e poi le parole. George and Ira Gershwin, the story is, is that the emotional situation would be set up working with the team, and uh, George would write a melody, and then poor Ira would have to go away and fit words to what George created. How does it work with you? That, I mean, that has happened. Like, I wrote the, the speaking of grapes, I wrote the prelude to act three, and then Michael Corey decided that it was, um, I'll be there. So that, but it's rare. It's usually for me, I am personally inspired by words and um, by architecture. You know, like, um, it, uh, like even something like Morningstar, you sort of have to know where you're going. And, and music begins like the building. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But each piece is put together differently. Um, I use Grapes Lap just because that piece sort of changed how it worked. But for example, it was such a big piece, I would go in and find hot spots. And by hot, I mean like something that got me going. And then if you do those first, you start having like sort of building blocks that you can work from. Like, oh, that's that theme, and that's that theme. You know, um, with something like um, Morningstar, Bill and I, it, it was such a different process in terms of the way we're ad we were adapting it. And, um, but it's, it, it does change for every piece, although now it really is. Sketch it in the piano at the living room, then go into the computer. You mentioned something a moment ago about how you were inspired by words. Back in your childhood, as you were beginning to learn how to read and beginning to discover the world of words, was there a point when they became magical for you? And can you remember that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's very specific because um, I had three older sisters, and my oldest sister, Susan, would put me to bed at night by reading poetry to me. And she would read, in particular, Edna Savard Tremolay. <laughs> and she went to Vassar, because Edna Savard Tremolay went there. And um, she even gave me a record. I had a record of Edna Savard Tremolay saying her poems, and I like, had them in my head, you know, like her <laughs> crazy voice. So um, words, poetry was the bomb for me. You know what I mean? It was like lullaby. And uh, so I never had that relationship to poetry where it was obscure or obtuse or difficult to understand. It was always just something I turned to, to to feel a sense of order in my own life. You have chosen often for your operatic subjects, or they have been chosen for you, uh, events in history, either real or fictionalized. And yes. we're going to begin this evening by taking ourselves back to the time of the American Civil War. How did Rappahannock come about for you? It came about, it was right after we closed Grapes of Wrath. Kelly O'Hara and Rob Fisher had done a concert at the Virginia Arts Festival. And um, Rob Cross, who runs the Virginia Arts Festival, told them he wanted to commission a new piece. And it was really nice, but Kelly and Rob Fisher said, commission Ricky. So Kelly um, brought Rob Cross to New York, and we all had brunch. And we didn't talk about a piece. We just said, I said, yes, I would love to. And then about a month later, Rob Cross and Kate came and said it was going to be the, is it the sesquicentennial of the Civil War? And we were going to open whatever we wrote on the, the anniversary of the Fort Sumter. 
And um, as soon as they said that to me, I instinctively said, like, the orchestra has, should have like 15 or 17 pieces, four singers, um, and I wanted to work with Mark Campbell. We had been talking about working together, and as I wanted to work with a lyricist. I wanted it to be like um, something that could accrue as a set of songs. And then I brought um, Mark aboard, and Mark is the one who decided on um, to focus it in Rappahannock County, since we were opening a piece in Virginia, and to take each year of the Civil War and to create songs for each year and allow the piece to be able to tell the story that way. To, to with all these different characters and letters and journals and quite, quite a good job. So we're going to begin with two excerpts from Rappahannock County yes. and I'm wondering if you'd set them up for us yes. in terms of the story. Yes, the first uh, song that we're gonna do is called I Seen Snow. And one thing I was, fascinated about, Mark and I were fascinated about, it was during the Civil War how there was no infrastructure to get people off the battlefield if they were injured. So often people just lay there and died when they could have been saved. And so this is a young soldier who's injured on the battlefield and he half thinks that his brothers, um, his brothers in battle are going to come and get him but he's also sort of dazzled by the snow as he's bleeding to death. So that's I Seen Snow. And then the second number we're gonna do is called um, Victory at Manassas. And um, that's a trio for a telegraph operator, a newspaper man, and a housewife. And basically, it's all about the battle, the first battle um, in the Civil War at, at Manassas when it looked like the South had won the war and it was all gonna end. And so that's what they think, they fab fabulous, we won the war. And of course, that is not the case. We're going to have Thomas Bagwell at the piano. Also, Ricky will join uh, to create more of an orchestral sound. Turn pages from time to time as well. And uh, Matthew Tuell will sing I Seen Snow. And Faith Sherman, uh, Matthew Tuell and Matthew Worth will sing Victory at Manassas. Please welcome our artists for the first musical selection. <laughs>
most insistent sound. I jumped up and he called his wife was sent. When I found out what it meant, all my heart began to bound. Victory at Manassas, praise the Lord. I need to continually put in plugs for Cincinnati Opera, but your collaborator, Mark Campbell, on Rappahannock County, is also the author of the libretto for this summer's presentation of Kevin Plutz's opera, Silent Night, yes. at Cincinnati Opera. And hearing those words about the optimistic nature of the South in 1861 when they thought they had won the war, the situation for Silent Night is a very similar thing because in the early days of World War I, the Germans thought they would have a swift victory. And by the time we get to Christmas of 1914, of course, French warfare has set in, and everybody realizes that this is going to be a very, very long war, <laughs> basically fighting until everyone is dead. Mm -hmm. And the parallels between these two wars are, are quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. uh, the next thing I'd love to talk a little bit about is um, connective tissue. Mm. Because, um, <laughs> no, are there any doctors in the house? Sorry. I love connective tissue. <laughs> Well, uh, a conductor friend of mine says he can, beat, take, he can teach anybody to beat in four. Mm -hmm. But the real gift of a conductor is making the transition from one tempo to the next, from one mood to the next. And for me, the real gift of an opera composer, people like Puccini do it so brilliantly, is moving from one mood to the next, one aria to the next. And I'm wondering if you talk a little bit about, as you moved into the world of through composed opera, um, was that, no, that notion of connective tissue ever a challenge? How did you 
graft that into your compositional style mm. to make certain that it just isn't a succession of tunes with dialogue, like a musical. Well, you know, everything, it's funny, I see Tom Chapulo sing for me, a composer, so it reminds me. But everything is um, prosody for me. You, you're looking at the way, first of all, the word, the way the words seem to want to be set. And there is, you're sort of plotting the dramatic action. And so the idea of connective tissue is trying to meet at every moment exactly what you think dramatically that moment should sound like. That is, I mean, to tell you the truth, that's the hard part. It's like the arias, you get to the aria and it's like, oh, fun. You get to <laughs> breathe and do your aria. But all the in-between stuff, like there's, there's a uh, sequence in, um, in Grapes of Wrath, the, the uh, Hooverville sequence, where there's like 50 beats in one sequence. And you just, the thing about opera composing is trying to meet with everything in your arsenal the moments dramatically with, with what you feel is right. You know, so it's, but it, there's also the idea of connective tissue even in, I mean, I think of something like ice and snow and just how you put the ideas together and how all of a sudden Mark's, in Mark's words when he goes, 17, never, you know, see, kissed a girl outside Bogalusa. And suddenly you're just constantly trying to rise to the moment, you know what I mean? To be, to be in your voice but also authentic to the drama. You said that you became enamored of poetry almost before you could walk or really were well in any, any time into your regular formal education. And as a composer, when you actually have poetic text, um, where do you start with it? Because it, it could turn into recitative type, it could turn into an aria. How does the text speak to you, as it were? Um, now, first of all, just I teach, I'll just say, I, I've taught around the country this class that I made up, right? And the class is called A Gesture on Behalf of the Poem. And in this class, like say, you were all composers, and, and we were going to do our class. God help us. <laughs> you never know. Well, some of you are. But I would have everybody pick a poem, right? And memorize it. But I'd say, like, pick a poem you're going to want to live with for a little while. And memorize it. And then the, the composer has to keep saying the poem to the class over and over again until we believe they embody that text. And only then can they make a gesture on behalf of that poem musically. But I like to really live with words to really um, to feel like they sort of gurgle and bubble inside of me and then I know what to do musically. And that's why I start, like for example, one of the reasons I started this evening with Ice and Snow, that was the hot spot for me. That was how I started Rap Ahead of County. Mark had given me many other things, but I knew I could get myself going right away with that. You know, um, it, it's just, it's, 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 but for each thing it's different. It, it's like, um, like Roy Svabrick, like we're doing this, this opera about, it, it's every, this one, something I wanted to say, okay, every writer you work with, Bill Hoffman, Mark Campbell, Royce Vavrick, right? You're, you're talking about M Michael Corey. You're talking about very different people, very different personalities. And in a way, you're getting to know them through the words that they've given you to set to music. And I would say, at least for me, each one of those pieces is very different because I'm working with a completely different person who writes words in a completely different way. And it's like entering you know, Royce's wacky world and Bill's like, Bill and I sort of come from a similar background, you know. It's like I, I really, I feel in a way like Morningstar feels like my absolute Jewish piece, you know. <laughs> like even there's, there's obviously, um, there's a Kaddish in um, Morningstar and it's definitely for me though it is the Kaddish for the victims of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory um, women, it's also a Kaddish for my father. You know what I mean? That's how I got it going. But the way I said it was, Tony Kushner had made a recording of the Kaddish for me, and I played it at Jeffrey, my partner's grave, when he died in 1996. So I had this incredibly um, resonant recording of Tony saying the Kaddish. And when I set it to music, 
I just listened to him over and over again. So it's all those things that get into, I mean, I don't even know if that's an answer to your question, mm -hmm. but setting words is a very rich thing. And even the way you pick them, or your relationship with your librettist. It's like, it's very scary to ask a librettist to write a piece for you, because it could be that they would write something that you don't connect with. Mm -hmm. And then you'd, how would you say, I can't do this? But I have to connect with the words. And I feel like I've been lucky, because I like, I like my boys. <laughs> <laughs> Verdi tortured his librettists. Yes. Do you torture yours? <laughs> um, <laughs> if anyone wants to go. There's I one don't, in the room. Speak, <laughs> speak no, up, please. I don't think I torture them. I, I think I can be exacting. Like, and I know what I want. I mean, a really good example is, for example, um, Royce and I, in, when we wrote um, 27 recently, there was a whole number about Alice singing about the wives of geniuses, that she sits with the geniuses, while, with the wives of geniuses while Gertrude sits with the geniuses. And I knew when I started, like, I was like, this has to be a number. And I was like, Royce, I, I called him and I said, you have to go way further with this. You know what I mean? Like, practically dancing girls and feathers and the whole thing. You know, or Bill, even in, um, in for people who will see Morningstar, there's a moment with Sadie in Act One where she finally sings about the whole notion of three loving sisters and feeling like the ugly one and feeling like the outcast. And I remember, I mean, Bill would totally collude, but like the first thing, thing he gave me, like there were like five pages on the king and queen of Poland, and I don't know exactly, what I'm saying, but I was like, oh my God, Bill, I feel this is circuitous. And I'm like, just getting him to finally center in on the story, but that was his process, that, right? Like that, his process was he had to write all around it until he wrote to the center of it. And you have to, sometimes you have to be patient with your librettist, but you also, you know what you need. And that's when you're a pain in the ass, when you won't shut up till you get it. It's you like know. the analogy with a sculptor who, when he was asked how he creates these beautiful sculptures, he has a block of marble, and he chips the marble away until the figure appears. And yeah, only they're is, the marble, and you're chipping at them. <laughs> yeah. Ouch. Sorry, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> we have a musical selection from your most recent opera, a yeah. work that only premiered a few weeks ago in Houston and yes. is about to be performed again. Yes, it was just in L.A. and now it goes to Philly. Right. L.A., sorry, yes. not, not Houston. And it's called The Coffin in Egypt, written specifically with the talents of one particular performer in mind, one of our greatest 20th and 21st century performers, Frederica von Stade. Yes. Who seems to be failing retirement miserably. Oh, I know. <laughs> she sounds exquisitely beautiful and totally like she's 30. Well, we have Faith Sherman to perform an excerpt from the Coffin in Egypt, Coffin in Egypt for us tonight. And I'm wondering if you'd set up the story and the excerpt for us. Yes, absolutely. Um, so think of Faith as 90 years old. She's playing Myrtle Bledsoe. A Coffin in Egypt is based on a play by Horton Foote. And for those of you who don't know who Horton Foote was, he wrote the screenplay to, to Kill a Mockingbird. Um, last night, I, I showed Kevin the movie Tender Mercies. Oh my God. He wrote that movie. He wrote um, A Trip to Bountiful. Great Texan writer. So this is one woman in Egypt, Texas, looking back on her life. And it's sort of like she's telling her story before she can finally let it go and before she can forgive her husband and herself. And so this is just a moment um, when Myrtle is talking to this character named Jesse, and she just says, I'll tell you this, though. Well, it's, she just finally has a moment where she talks about why she ended up here, mm -hmm. what it was about this place that was so addictive for her. So it's called The Open Prairie. Please welcome Faith Sherman, along with our pianists, to sing an excerpt from A Coffin in Egypt.
I should say, can I say one thing about that piece? Please. That um, Leonard Folia um, wrote the libretto to that, and he also directed it. And it came about because Lenny had directed the world premiere of the play with Glynis Johns, and it was a one-woman play. And the truth was, it's the play had problems because it's gigantic and too hard to memorize. So it was sort of a smart idea on Lenny's behalf to make it into an opera because um, music has an inherent architecture that makes words in a way easier to remember than if you're just speaking them. So, Lenny. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Our third topic of conversation is called the redheaded stepchild. And every composer, if they have a career of any duration, has, as it were, the one that got away, a production or a project that came close, but no cigar, or something that they had written and then put away in a drawer thinking, someday I might come back to that, and maybe never does. For you, the redheaded stepchild uh, has had a happy ending in that um, Cincinnati Opera next summer will give the world premiere of a work of yours that was begun over a decade ago yeah. called Morning Star. And I'm wondering if you'd tell us a little of the history of how Morning Star first came about and how it's been revived, as it were. Yeah. Um, I was asked to be the composer in residence at the Lyric Opera of Chicago. And I, went, I decided I wanted to write this piece about my family that I ended up writing at another point. And um, one day I got this call from Richard Perlman, who was running the studio there. And he, he had just seen this play, Morning Star, at Steppenwolf. And he said, I think you should read that play because um, it's, it might get you going. And I think maybe they had some trepidation about like all I had were all these fragments about my family. And they were like, what is this going to turn into? So I, was, I, I read in the bathtub. I took a bubble bath, and I read the play. And I called um, Bill Hoffman. And I was like, oh my god, you have to read this play. Because I was, I was determined to do something with Bill. To put it in perspective, it's a play from 1940 or 1941 by Sylvia Regan? Yes. And the thing about the play was it's, um, first of all, three daughters and a brother. It was the same constellation as my family. The mother's name, and it's a, it's a Jewish family, or Jewish mother who has moved her kids, from, um, from Europe to escape the um, pogroms. And, the, and what her name is Rebecca Felderman. And, and the central event of this um, piece is the Triangle Shirt Factory fire. And um, my grandmother, my mother's mother, worked at the Triangle Shirt Factory. And her name was Rebecca Lieberman. Mm. And on the day of the fire, she was homesick. So it had a very, like, it had incredible resonance for me. So um, Bill and I uh, talked, we, we had a whole talk about adapting it. And there was one moment with Bill where he was really into this Yiddish play called The God of Vengeance. And that was one, so I read that, but I couldn't, this, this was it. And then what happened was we were really commissioned to write it for the lyric opera was going to, for the first time, um, collaborate with the Goodman Theater. And so we were going to write something like a sort of hybrid opera musical with scenes, blah, 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 for that collaboration. And like, I know this is being streamed, and I'm talking out of school, but they broke up, like right in the middle of our. And so we had this piece written. And we did a fabulous workshop of it. But then it sort of got shelved, because the whole context for its being written went away. And then there was a moment when Darren Woods um, and Joe Illick heard it. And we did a sort of like workshop type situation at the Siva Colony. But I felt in my heart that this piece was not done. And I'm a Taurus. I'm really stubborn. And I won't let go of something until it's ready. <laughs> so um, when before you came to this picture, Robin Guarino and Marcus Kushla, who from Cincinnati Opera, had this thing called Opera Fusion, where they, they wanted me to workshop a piece. And I said, I will do that if you allow me to bring Morningstar. I want to be in a situation where Bill and I can look at the piece, and it'll be like, I want to throw a bomb at it and see what happens if we completely reconstruct it, look at it. And, um, and then what happened was they, Jim Robinson, who's the artistic director of Opera Theater of St. Louis, suggested a director named Ron Daniels. And it's, it's sort of fun, because Ron called me on the phone one day before I even met him, and he goes, are you open to um, some su dramaturgical suggestions? <laughs> and it's so funny, now that I know him, that I said this to him, and I go, if you're smart. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, 
<laughs> no, because there's so many times that people have a million opinions about what you write. And it's like, all right, who are you? You know, and he ended up, he's brilliant. And he was fabulous for Bill and I because Ron doesn't have a co-dependent bone in his body. He, he, he has no interest in taking care of you. So he looks like, if there's anything he doesn't like, he like rolls his eyes. He's like, what is that doing there? You know, it's just like, it was like that. So it was so easy and you could tell he's totally brilliant. So you trust him and he was great with Bill and I. He would be like, you know, I, I think that this moment needs like the women dreaming or what are you doing with the Kaddish at the end of Act One? That needs to come at the end of the piece. And right, right, you just trusted him and it was, it was delicious. Like, and then, and what was great was I had no idea about you guys doing the opera. I was just there to look at the piece. So I wasn't doing this for anyone but me and Bill to look at our baby and make it work, you know? And then what happened was like 10 minutes before we're supposed to do the little public workshop, I suddenly see you walking in. I'm like, what are you doing here? I thought you were in Vienna. I was. Like, you were in Vienna. You're like, <laughs> the day before. <laughs> it's so weird. And he goes, Patty. Patty Beggs is the other person that the Our general, general director. Yeah. Right, right. She told him to come. And then I thought, hmm, that's sort of nice. And then it, we had a lovely workshop. And then you guys um, had us do another workshop of the piece. And we worked further on it. And then after that workshop, you called us into your little office. And, you talked about scale, and then we worked further on it. And now we're, it's so exciting for me. It's like your baby is finally going to be born. I love these people. I love these characters. And just to say, I think something wonderful happened that I don't think Bill would argue about in terms of the process, which was what Ron brought to the table, besides for really like tight sense of sort of what were the so socioeconomic, psychological climate that the piece was written in, but also, um, the play. And Bill and I had departed in a lot of ways from the material of the play. And Ron sort of gently steered us back to Sylvia Regan, which was a lovely thing, because I feel like it's very much what Bill and I created. But I would say now that there's sort of like some of her structure helped us in the rewrite. And um, so to yeah. put it in context, too, Opera Fusion New Works was an outgrowth of a long time collaboration between Cincinnati Opera and the College Conservatory of Music at the University of Cincinnati. I like to say that we were living in sin for many years, uh, and then we sort of legitimized our relationship with grants from the Corbett Foundation and a very, very seminal grant from the Mellon Foundation that allowed us to fund a series of workshops over a number of years. And Ricky is right. The initial premise of Opera Fusion New Works, of which Marcus is artistic director, and Robin Guarino is the artistic director from the CCM side, was to seek out opera producers and composers who had works that were getting ready for the stage. Doubt, for example, that was done at Minnesota Opera. Champion, that was done at the Opera Theater of St. Louis. And there are more to come. And these were initially the ideas of let's help a piece that's on the way to the stage get that final polish with the advantage of having the wonderful stable of singers from CCM and the professional production capabilities of a major opera company in um, Cincinnati Opera. And I'll tell my own little story of sitting in the room. It's the kind of thing that if you're a producer of opera, you hope happens at least once in your career. For me, it's happened now more than once. And I consider myself doubly blessed because as I was sitting and listening to the then not quite finished product, but pretty close to finished product of Morningstar, um, I got a lump in my throat because Morningstar, I hope you will come and see it, does what any opera hopes to do in the, at the background of major events that are happening in history or in a particular location. What makes an opera so direct and so immediate to a listener is that it's about people coping with these events against the big backdrop of history. Let's talk about the granddaddy of them all in grand opera, Aida. Aida is set against the backdrop of the wars between Egypt and Ethiopia, but it's really about choosing the wrong person to love and then being at the mercy of a vengeful third party. That's happened in probably most of your lives in one way or another, either your own lives or you've been touched by it in some other part of your family. Morningstar does the same thing. The Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, World War I, the Depression, they are all backdrops to this intensely human experience of a hugely uh, dedicated mother who is simply trying to keep her family together. 
surviving the pogroms of Russia, surviving losing a daughter in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, surviving the Depression, and also all the while trying to decide which she, I won't give it away, has a struggle with throughout the opera, whether to allow her heart to open finally to love. It's an incredibly beautiful piece. We are intensely proud of being able to give the world premiere next summer. And so we thought we'd give you a look into the composer's workshop. And for the first time in public, for uh, an uninvited audience of just our board members, give you an excerpt from this marvelous opera. Ricky, would you set it up? Yes. So um, when Becky came with her daughters to um, the United States, um, before she came, her husband, Jacob, was murdered. And she comes to the United States with his best friend, Aaron Greenspan. And it, it, Aaron is someone who, like, for a long time is just sort of hanging out on her couch in the, in the living room of a tenement. So you, it means probably the whole apartment was as big as this stage. And finally, he sort of gets up and makes something of himself. Um, which he, and he starts to flower in act two. And he comes back after not having seen Becky for a long time at this moment and with the sole intention of getting her finally to marry him. And um, so it's, it's a, a little, and he's coming from, just to say he's coming from having just run into Prince, who is the African American that in the first act sort of works for the Feldman family, and, but all of a sudden in act two, he's selling apples on the street, because in act two we begin and it's the depression. Very so um, he's got some apples in his hand. Would you please welcome Matthew Wirth and Deanne Meek to sing Marry Me Becky from Morning Star. <laughs> Paint. I can't see up close. Oh, good. 
have to come next summer to see if she does eventually say yes or no. <laughs> and I did. I, the one thing, if we did, we say that by by that point, did her daughter has died in the Triangle Shirt Factory, her youngest daughter, and her um, son Jaime has died in the war. And her other daughter, the ugly duckling daughter, Sadie, has basically run Aaron out of business. Yeah, she's become a very bad girl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Naughty. Topic number four, I've titled Social Conviction. It's, oh. You have created operas that are Love stories. You've, of course, done your own treatment of uh, the Orpheus story. Uh, you've done things like Green Sneakers. But you seem also to be drawn very strongly, um, already tonight, three operas that have very much at their heart uh, social issues. And I'm wondering if you could speak to, from your own perspective, we have great composers of the past. I keep going back to Verdi because he was the quintessential 19th century political realist, Nabucco, of course, being a, a wonderful example and going on in his career. But do you feel you've got a responsibility to speak to social convention in your work? I do, and I, it's funny, because when you were talking, I was thinking about, you know, there's a great um, Robert Lowell, the, the poet. He, there's a quote, he was asked why he writes poems, and he said, to break people's hearts. And um, I feel, I identify with, I feel very, uh, sensitized to the problems of the world. I often feel, though I'm incredibly gregarious, I often feel sad, sad about life and about what happens to people. And um, I want to write, I want to create a body of work that matters. Do you know what I mean? Um, I like the idea of entertainment, but it has to matter to me. And it, there's also the thing, too, of like something that gets you going. And you know, The Grapes of Wrath, that was an idea that was brought to me. And I totally, like, it was Dale Johnson from Minnesota Opera. And he said, we want, we want you to write an opera of The Grapes of Wrath. And I remember saying, all right, let me reread the book. And you know, like, I totally hadn't read it. <laughs> but I was like, <laughs> reread it. You can be forgiven. I haven't read Moby Dick, but don't tell him. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh. So, but I read this book, and it, it like, took hold of me and practically choked me to death. It was so profound and meaningful to me at that moment and so resonant and pertinent and cogent. And I, I was terrified to write that opera. But I also felt like if the grapes of wrath is being given to like, you know, Ricky Gordon, Jew from Long Island, you know what I mean? I just felt like, OK, whatever. You know, I just felt like I have to say yes to this. It felt like a destiny moment. And then it was such a full, big experience to write it. I remember calling Kevin from a hotel room when I was nearing the end of it. And I was like, oh my god, I so have to be done with the Jodes. Because I was so, I, I just felt like I was going to die of sadness. Do you know what I mean? And, but it was, all, there was, a, it was an incredible experience writing it. But yes, it's important to me that my work be meaningful. And um, a lot of times for me, like when you mentioned Green Sneakers and Orpheus and Eurydice, it means turning myself inside out, um, being incredibly intimate in my work. But it feels like that's the task. That's the job. You know, I look at these performers and how, how much they give of themselves. I want to be like them. I want to give everything I have to what I do. We do have the good fortune of having Deanne Meek, who created the music we're about to hear, to sing an excerpt from The Grapes of Wrath, your first full-length opera, correct? Yeah, well. First grand opera. My first grand opera, yeah, 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 yeah. Would you set the scene while yeah. I set the stage? Yes, this is, um, the, the name of the aria is Us. And for the record, um, this, well, this is the second thing I wrote. But Michael Corey, when he writes librettos, he illustrates them. And there was this beautiful um, photograph of an empty room. And that was the name of the scene was Ma Jode is at Uncle John's cabin sweeping it out, cleaning before the Jodes get on the road and leave their ruined land and their tractored down house. And, um, and she has her, all of her possessions in a box. And there's a fire burning. And she's basically deciding what they can take and what they have to leave. You know, they have very little room on the truck. So, it's called Us. And I just, I'll tell you one thing, because I think it's an interesting thing about libretto writing. Michael had read in one of the, I believe it was one of the Hooverville scenes, when a woman just says, 
this dead land is us. All its hardship is us. And it was such that that was something beautiful that he did in that libretto, was he decided to make this Ma Jodes aria. And then because the whole Grapes of Wrath is about an us-ness, do you know what I mean? It ended up being the theme Ma Jodes sings, which is this dead land is us, ends up being like a frame that ties the whole opera together. Wonderful. Let's okay. welcome the original Ma Jode, Diane Meek, and joined by Matthew Wirth for Us from the Grapes of Wrath.
I took my beta blocker. <laughs> Stay awake. There's one more question. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> Our final topic of conversation mm -hmm. is uh, titled From Black and White to Color. Mm. And it goes back to your composing process. And although we don't have an orchestra with us here tonight, we have piano. Tell us a little bit about how you think of the orchestra and how you orchestrate. Where do you find the colors? How do you decide? how voices should get what instruments, the scope and the scale and the texture that you wish to create in an orchestral finished product of a school. It's basically, I mean, the orchestra is another character. Do you know what I mean? And a lot of times you know, like when I write, when I talked about moving um, from the piano to the computer, I start adding lines. That's a big part of, so when I sit and play people my sort of mini files, I've added all these orchestral lines. So a lot of times I'm writing on two piano staffs, and then there's one or two instrumental staffs. And um, so, like, for example, um, with. So it's your own version of what composers used to call short score. Yes. Which is usually four staffs. bigger. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and um, like with Coffin in Egypt, it, it, it has a funny story orchestrally because um, when they first came to me, they said I could have 13 pieces like um, Turn of the Screw, Britain's Turn of the Screw has 13 sure. pieces. Um, but there was going to be this element of gospel singers. And at first, they thought the gospel singers were going to be off stage. And at, as soon as I started writing the piece and I heard the gospel songs in my head, I was like, oh, no, they're going to have to be on stage. <laughs> so I traded four players. I was like, all right, you can have four players, but you have to give me four gospel singers. <laughs> so then I had nine players, you know, and it's just about picking like enough players to make enough noise and like what is going to be like the world of, so it ended up being, for example, that the gospel songs are mostly accompanied by the piano because they're in the church across the yard mm -hmm. and then how you bring the instruments to color, myrtles, you know, or for example, um, in Morningstar, there are more clarinets. Do you know what I mean? Um, and it's to give it a kind of Jewish klezmer feel. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, Grapes of Wrath, we wanted it to sound epic, you know what I mean? And um, it's a, quite a big orchestration, and there's um, harmonica and banjo and guitar. And so, you know, it's, each piece has its own demands, you know? Um, the uh, 27 is sort of Stravinsky-esque, uh -huh. you know? Um, and because that piece is sort of a wacky universe, when I was writing 27, which we're going to get to, I was thinking about Verdi's Falstaff, and I was thinking about Albert Herring, and I was uh, thinking about Germaine Taillefer, the, um, the, the only female member of Les Cis. You know, So I wanted to give it a sort of Frenchy, farcical, Stravinsky-esque, weird, skewed universe feel. How did 27 come about? 27 came about because um, Jim Robinson called me, I believe it was right after I did Rap Anna County, and he said, we want to commission a piece from you for Stephanie Blythe. And the second he said Stephanie, and of course I'm a huge fan of Stephanie, I said Gertrude Stein. <laughs> because um, I had been obsessed with Gertrude Stein since um, my first year of college, I got a really bad cold. And I grabbed a book off the shelf that someone had called Charm Circle, and all I did was read, eat tangerines for a week and read Charmed Circle. And I was like, oh my god, I'm obsessed with this woman. <laughs> and literally, it was the first time, I mean, I th think it's the first time I read about a historical character that I decided I had to start shaping my life after. Like, I started, I started um, Did you start buying... making funny brownie? <laughs> I became a lesbian. No, um, I started, <laughs> I started buying art at Carnegie Mellon. And then when I first came to New York, um, in my sort of drug adult haze, I would have like um, salons every Saturday night. And I would premiere all my new pieces in my little salon and invite whoever I thought was interesting. You know what I mean? I felt like I needed to create like her milieu and I had to think of everyone in my life as one of her denizens. And the thing about Stephanie is, Stephanie has a huge voice 
and she is by nature. You do not enter a room that Stephanie's in without her presiding. You know what I mean? Stephanie is a presider. And that's what Gertrude Stein did. That's what her life was. She presided over interesting people, over interesting events. Um, so it seemed the perfect idea. A funny little thing is Jim Robinson then had one little blip where he decided, what about Belle Gunnis? Belle Gunnis is the most horrible female serial murderer in American history. <laughs> she would like, she was a Norwegian immigrant. She would write letters to men. They would come to, the, come to live with her on her farm. She'd bash their head in, cut them into a thousand pieces, bury them all over the farm. And I was like, OK. <laughs> so I, I read all about her. And Stephanie came over one day. I was like, OK. And I totally convinced her to read it, knowing, knowing that all I had to do was give her the book about Bucket Balgunas. So I give it to Stephanie, who's like a genius. And that night, she calls me on the phone. She goes, you know what? I don't think this woman should be remembered. <laughs> I was like, we're back to Gertrude. So then Royce Vavrek comes into the picture. And with Royce, um, I was in a bind. I needed a libretto quickly. And the good thing about Royce, besides that he's brilliant, is he's young, hungry, and he wanted to work with me. So I was like, OK, Royce, if you can read like 15 books and write me a libretto in a month, you have the job. And he basically did it. He, it, was, it was, I called him March 16th. I started the opera May 21st. And the only things I told him were, I had some stipulations. I knew I wanted the paintings to sing. I knew that I didn't want to whitewash Gertrude, that I, I am very interested in the speculation of how Gertrude Stein stayed safe during World War II. She and Alice, Jews, lesbians, and they were perfectly safe. They always had what they needed, and their paintings were. In occupied Paris. Yes. So there's talk about their best friend, Bernard Foy, who um, was imprisoned as a collaborator with the Vichy government. So I'm not saying that, that she did it, but I, but I thought, now that we know that, that has to be in the piece. Um, and Royce sort of went away, and he decided Alice was a major character. He actually came up with a brilliant conceit, which was um, the thing Alice Betoklas outlived Gertrude by like mm -hmm. 20 years. She converted to Christianity because she wanted to be a member of a religion that she felt could absorb the idea that she would live in eternity forever with Gertrude when she died. So it's very poignant. And um, so Royce has her because this whole idea of like who she was when Gertrude died and how much she loved Gertrude and her whole life was keeping the legacy of Gertrude alive. So the opera begins with a prologue, and the prologue is called Alice Knits the World, right? And she basically knits back to life, her life with Gertrude. And at one point, all of a sudden, Gertrude comes onto the stage, and she's like, de la part de qui venez-vous? Who invited you? And then she's like, how did I get here? <laughs> I'm supposed to be dead. So it's a very entertaining piece. Um, and should I, should I set up this? Um, we and, should and say that it gets its world premiere this summer, presented by the Opera Theater of St. Louis. Yeah. So please set up this piece while right. I set up the stand. So um, Royce, um, he decided the form of the piece was it's one act, and it's about 90 minutes, and it's in five acts in one act, as well as this prologue. And in act two, so the prologue is Alice Knits the World. Act one is the big event of act one is everybody is invited to the salon for the unveiling of Picasso's portrait of Gertrude Stein, which supposedly she sat for 100 times or 99 times. Act two is World War I. Act three is the lost generation, which is when Picasso and Hemingway come in. By the way, in act one, we have Matisse, Picasso, then, um, and Leo Stein. Then in act four is World War II, and that's when Gertrude dies. And then act five is Alice alone on the day that the Picasso portrait is being picked up and taken to the Metropolitan Museum. So the piece Stephanie's going to do is called Lost Boys. And she's going to do it with both Matthews. It's like the Matthew Festival tonight. But she is, um, she, it, it's World War I, and they don't have any, um, it's freezing cold in their apartment. She wants, she wants coal. She wants cigarettes. She wants eggs. So she sort of goes out. Gertrude Stein was um, famous for sort of seducing people into giving her anything with her charisma. And she finds a doughboy in the street. And just so you know, 
when he, uh, he has a line where he says he's going to go look for things for her, and suddenly we hear bombs dropping during this sort of tango you'll hear. And that's when she sings, she has a little aria called Lost Boys. And then it ends with um, a recap of something that happened at the beginning of the opera, where suddenly the three, the three men that Royce has set up as playing everything in the universe sing, Have You Visited Rue de Florus? Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Thomas Bagwell, pianist, and Stephanie Blythe.
Oh, okay. <laughs> Come on, you guys. to invite everyone here to join us for a reception uh, in the foyer and as Mark Skorka said at the beginning of this wonderful evening hosted by our friends at the National Opera Center please feel free to explore the facility it is a wonder that this place exists it is a joy for all of us who work in the world of opera to have a home here in New York and to have a place that is all about continuing our art form Cincinnati Opera is proud to have been here this evening. We continue our own commitment to work with living composers this summer with performances of Silent Night by Kevin Putz and Mark Campbell, and next summer with Morning Star by Ricky and this wonderful team, Bill Hoffman and Ron Daniels, who are here with us tonight. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, guys. <laughs> So, oh, great, mate. The bomb. He's <laughs> great. <laughs> Fun, mate.